The following program was paid for by the friends and partners of Neil Thomas Ministries. Hallelujah. So I'm going to put a picture up. And I'm going to talk about this picture, if it's there. Now, what do I see? What do I know? What do I feel about this? What do you see? What do you know? And what do you feel? Well, first off, I want to say I'm not here to talk about some human rights or some women rights. I'm really here just to talk about Jesus and the rights that he's given us and the rights that Satan has taken away from us. And in this, this picture, what do I know? Well, I'll tell you what I do know. I know that this is a woman. I know that she's begging because in the country that she lives in, for her to be doing this, she would have to be a widow because if she's not a widow, she wouldn't, shouldn't be out in the open street anyway without a man. I know that that garment that she's wearing weighs seven kilos. It's a heavy garment. It's very heavy on her head. So if she stands, the weight of it is very heavy. So she can't walk very far because the garment is so, so heavy. I know that she's not allowed to show any skin. I know that she's not allowed to speak, and I know that she's not allowed to call out. I know that she's got to wear those shoes, and those shoes are not to make any type of noise at all. So they can't be like these shoes that I'm wearing today. They have to make absolutely no noise. I know she can't whisper. And I can see that it's very cold there. That's what I know about her. That's all I know. I know she's faceless and to me I know she's nameless. So that's all that I know. And I know this is happening now in a country in this world and I know that because I've researched and I've watched a documentary on it. So I know it. It's true. But in knowing that, what do I see? Well, I see despair. I see the loss of all rights. I see a faceless, nameless woman. I see the denigration of a society. I see Satan. That's what I see. I don't know what you see, but I see Satan. Abandonment. Loss of any kind of dignity. Shame. I don't know what words come to you. As you look longer, you're going to see more. As you look and you really look, and I mean really, really look at this picture. What do I feel? I feel incredibly sad, incredibly angry. I feel, well, I, I, my feelings are, are all over the place because the longer I look, the more I begin to not just know and see, I begin to feel. The longer you look, I'm hoping you'll feel. I see a society of no compassion, but when I look, I see Satan, but I feel Jesus. I begin to feel the Spirit of God stir in me. I start to feel great compassion. And again, I want to point out, this is not a women's liberation thing. This is just a picture, 
and a story that I saw that I wanted, to, how could I explain Jesus? So I wanted to explain Jesus through this, through this picture. I don't know what you see and I don't know what you feel. I feel like I wish I could get into that picture and I wish I could put my arms around her. I wish I could know her name. I wish I could make wrong things right. And that's what I'm going to call my message. Jesus makes wrong things right. Make wrong things right. And this morning, if you're here, I want you to know something. Jesus makes wrong things right. Because he's righteous and he's right. He came here to make wrong things right. That's what I see. I see a woman... It's actually cold there because it's beginning to snow. So I see someone who probably isn't going to make it. I don't know what you see. But the more I look, the more I feel stirred. The more I feel, not the injustice of mankind, though that's part of it, it's the injustice of Satan. Do you understand? This is satanic, friends. Do you believe there is a devil? Do you understand there is a devil? This is satanic. This is what he does. So when was the last time this woman ever spoke? Who touched her? Who listened? Who heard? Probably nobody. Because it just can't be where she is. It's total and utter, utter bondage. And there's one thing I know about Jesus Christ. He came to set the captives free. That is why he came. He came to set the captives free. Can I do anything about this in where I am? No. The only power I've got is prayer. That's all I've got. I know there are people in this country that are Christians and are giving their life to do something about this. They are. And that's a high and precious call. But I don't want you to sit here and think that there isn't a satanic force that isn't still doing this. Of course there is. Were you ever in bondage, my friend? Have you ever been bound by anything? Who set you free? Who found you? Who sought you? Who prayed for you? Did someone bring you here? Do you know what it is to be free? Now we look at this and it, it's very hard for us to understand it. And we look and as, as, as Western people we tut tut. But it's far more than just human rights here. This is hell, heaven and hell. This is hell. This is Satan. This is why he is here on this earth. That's why he's come, friends. And he's a deceiver. And he's a robber and a murderer. And he takes away people's voices. And he takes away their rights. And he takes away their souls. And this is wrong, but Jesus is right. Now, I'm only going to share with you what interests me, yes. This sort of thing, it interests me, yes. It interests me because I fear God speak to me in it. I hear Jesus stir me in it. I hear Jesus say to me, but you're not in this situation. You might be in this situation, but you're not in this. So it humbles me and it stirs me. And my prayer is that what I share today, I'm not going to share anything that you don't already know, probably most of you, but if there's some one person watching or listening, it's for you this morning. 
Jesus has come to make wrong things right, brothers and sisters. He has come for you. He's come for the one. Isn't that wonderful to know? Were you the one once? Were you the one that he came for? What does that mean to you? And what will you do with it? What will you do with it, ladies? What will you do with it, men? Do you want... We look at this and it's quite distant, but it's somebody, somebody's perhaps mother, somebody's daughter, somebody's niece. It's somebody. Do you understand? It's a woman. It's someone. It's a human. And the more I look, what do I hear? I hear... Can I hear from this picture? Yes, I actually can hear from this picture. I hear a voice, a whimper. I hear a human, a soul, asking to be set free. I hear the tears. Do you, what do you hear? What do you hear this morning when you look at this picture? Do you hear anything? Well, that's what I hear. And that comes to my spirit, not just my human womanly self. It comes to my spirit because I hear a lost soul. I don't know what you hear, but I pray that you hear something. You see, sometimes, friends, we just have to stop in our very busy life, we just have to stop and ask God, what are you looking at? What do you know? What do you feel, Jesus, and what do you hear? Because friends, that's true Christianity. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here, I believe. What do you hear this morning? What is God speaking to you about? What is he asking you about? We're all in different seasons of our life. I totally understand that. doesn't mean we can't hear God. Do you ask him what is he feeling today? Do you ask him what is he looking at? Imagine what he sees when his eyes go to and fro from the earth. What is he looking at now? What does he see? His hand sometimes is held back because of places that refuse him and have thrown him out, such as this country. But is he concerned? Does he care? Does God change? No. In fact, as the world starts reeling more and more and more, he's more and more desperate, right? He's more and more desperate. So my question to us this morning is, what do you hear? What do you, brothers and sisters, who know Christ, hear? Well, I'll tell you what Jesus would do in this situation. And it's in, the, it's in the Bible, and I've actually shared this before, but I'm going to share it again, because I kept going to different stories, but I just kept coming back to this one over and over. So I just felt the Lord say to me, this, this, is, this is who I am. Share this. And it's in Mark chapter 5. And it's a very famous story. If you want to read, turn to Mark chapter 5. You know, Ezekiel tells us in chapter 16 that God is a seeker, that he's come to seek and seek the lost and seek the injured and the lame and he's come to bind them up and heal them. He's a seeker. And this morning, God is seeking somebody here, someone watching or listening. He's seeking someone. He's after somebody here. And we sang about it this morning. We know what he's done. He's died on a cross. He's given his life. 
to seek you. So that you could have a voice, so that you could have a way, so that you could have an identity, so that you could have a purpose, so that you could be a full person that he created you to be. The the Pharisees were really going for Jesus once. They kept asking him who he was and why he was doing what he was doing and he said to them, you know, I'm the light of the world, he said in John. I know where I'm going and I know where I came from. Do you know where you're going and where you came from? Because that's exactly what Christ will give you. He will give you direction. He will give you a true identity. He will say to you, you can know where you're going and where you come from. Most of the world do not know who they are, where they come from. They'll try it in their careers. They'll try it with sport. None of these things are bad in themselves, by the way. They'll try it in a relationship. I mean, how many people look for themselves in a relationship? They'll try it with money. Now, money is one of the most powerful things, isn't it? Money looks very sexy. It looks very powerful. It's very alluring, a person with a lot of money. I'm talking about not a Christian. I'm talking about a a non-Christian here. But money is not authority if it's rebellion in the wrong hands. People try to find it in sex. They look for it in sex. They think, if I could just have good sex, if I can just have sex, I'll find it. If I could be sexy, I'll find it. But it all leads to this picture, really, in, inside a human. It all leads to this. It really leads to this. Mark chapter 5. Jesus has been preaching to thousands, actually. He then crosses over and there's a massive storm, as you may know. And so here he takes his disciples way, way, way out of the box. Way out. I mean, can you imagine? There's been this massive, massive storm and now he's heard something and he knows about something and it's a demon-possessed man. And what Jesus knows is this man's possessed. And what Jesus knows is this man is this. He has no voice. He has no name. His complete identity has been stripped from him. He's lost his complete mind. He has no rights. Jesus knows that. And so he crosses over, verse 1, and they went across to the lake, to the region of of Gadarenes, or Gerizines. I've probably said that wrong. Now, this actual region was a Greek region, and it was not in a Jewish region region at all. Number one, he takes his disciples to a (laughs) non-Jew. These are Jews. Do you understand Jews? We don't live in a culture. We're so diverse and mixed. We, We don't know who we are, do we? We don't know what or who we are. But for them, they were Jews. And they were, for them, the the people. God's people. We don't mix with anyone else. So they get in the boat and off they go and they they get out of the boat. And when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with evil spirits came from the tombs to meet him. And this man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. Well, of course, when you have many spirits and demons, they become very strong. And we see this with young, angry men in our country, don't we? They become so strong, full of rejection and hurt and anger and jealousy and all kinds of things that they get so angry that they go and they bash people, they break into shops, they uh, hit police because they get strength from it. They get strength from their complete anger. And that's what this man had. He had this um, amazing strength, but it was violent. It wasn't good strength. It was violent strength. And so obviously there'd been people because it tells us that they tried to bind him. So obviously people had gone back and forth. Well, imagine, you know, uh, who's going today? Pick the short straw, Uh, me and you. (laughs) We have to go and try and bind this man. Imagine that short straw. But they gave up because it didn't work. 
So he'd become a bit of an urban myth, you know. The crazy man, let's go, let's have a bit of a circus soleil, let's go and show him, let's go and taunt him, let's go and, you know what I'm saying? Now Jesus must have heard about this man somewhere because he made a beeline for him. And he took his disciples with him. I don't know what he told them, but they must have at some stage realised, what the, we're heading over there? Do we? Greek? No, not only was he Greek, he was unclean. Now, a man like this would never be allowed to touch a rabbi, ever be allowed to touch a teacher because he was unclean and he had death. So I'm trying to paint a scene. Can you imagine the scene when they got off that boat? Imagine the scene. Here's Jesus with his disciples and what comes running at him? Because it says here, verse 4, For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the, broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs he sat and he would what? He would cry out and cut himself. And when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell at his feet in front of him. And he shouted at the top of his voice. So here we have a scene. Jesus has got off the boat with his disciples and there's a naked, crazy, hair everywhere, dirty, violent man running beeline for him and the disciples. And what would they be thinking as men? Unclean is running on us, unclean. But not Jesus. Why? Because Jesus knew who he was and where he was going. He knew exactly what was about to happen. That's what Christ gives us, friends. He gives us purpose, identity. He gives us order. He gives us truth. And he gives us purpose for why we're here. And so this man comes running. And what does he say? I say, what does he say? You say, what did the demons say? I say, what does he say? Because Jesus was there for a man. He wasn't there for demons. He was there for a man. He was there because he heard somewhere. He not only knew the story, he heard the story and he felt the story. And now he was going to act. He was there for the man. He was there for the man. And what does the man do? He says in a loud voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? You say it's the demons. I say it's the man. Yes, the demons were there. Yes, Jesus knew these were demons. They were a side issue to him because he knew he was going to deal with them. But this man runs full force at Jesus Christ. When was the last time you ran full force to Jesus? Because there's no other answer. There's no one else in this world that's going to be able to give you the answer. It's Jesus Christ, friends. Run to him. Run to him every day. Run to him. If you are in a situation right now and you need an answer, run to Jesus Christ because his spirit is here. His spirit is here this morning waiting for us. And so this man runs. I'm just trying to picture those poor disciples of this naked, unclean, dirty. <sighs> they had no weapons. What were they thinking? Okay, now we're going to have to protect Jesus, or what do, what do we do? You do this, you go that side, you, because he might just go absolutely nuts. He might jump on us and try and, and, and strangle Jesus. I don't know. I'm just thinking from a complete human point of view. Do you understand what I mean? What were they thinking? What were they seeing? And what happens? And it says, God, um, would you want my son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. Was that the demons or, G or the man? Some say it's the demons. I say it's the man. 
They were speaking, yes, but he was in there because he ran to Jesus. They didn't. He did. He recognised a man who knew what he was and where he was going. He recognised the Son of God. Do you recognise the Son of God when he speaks? Do you recognise the Son of God when he cries over these sort of things? Do you recognise him? Can you hear him this morning? And so he, he says, Jesus, please don't torture me anymore. Don't torture me. The world is crying out, my friends. Stop torturing me, Satan. Stop torturing me. Torturing me. Can you hear it? And what is our response to this cry? You know, he'd preach to thousands and that's great. You can, if that's what you want to do, if that's your goal to have thousands follow you, good on you. But I'm going to tell you something. This is very, very powerful, this, this story about one man. It's incredibly powerful. We may not all have the opportunity to preach to thousands, but we do have the opportunity to speak to one. And so, what does Jesus do? Does he do a big show? And be, whoosh. He just says to these spirits that are in there, because they're a side issue to him, they're like, get out. 6,000 came out. Legion. It's not the number to Jesus. They, were not as, they, they didn't have the power that he had. Why? Because he knew who he was. And friend, when you know, understand who you are, when you understand why you're here and the purpose and who you are, legion can come against you. But it can't stop you. It has to bow to the name of Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. It has to. In our life, those storms and those things must bow if we understand and know who we are in Jesus himself. Yes? And he tells him to get out. And then he says a beautiful thing in verse 9. He says, what is your name? And you again think it's the demons. I say it's the man. They answer. But I think he's going right for the man. If I was to meet this woman and I was to bend down and talk to this woman and I was with this woman, I would say to her, what is your name? What is your name? She has a name. Your name is who you are. Now this man, he'd, he'd, had, he'd had a life somewhere. He'd come from Decopolis, so he was probably educated. He had a mother and a father, could have been married and had a wife. But something had taken him completely over. He'd opened the door at some stage to this. And he didn't live in a society where there was any sort of mental health. There was no beyond blue, there was nothing. Thank God that we live in a place where we have these things. Thank goodness we do. Thank goodness for people that go and start these sort of charities. But there was nothing. There was no welfare. There wasn't anything that he could get. There wasn't anything for him. And I don't know if you've ever felt that situation in your life where you just think there is nothing for me. Nobody truly understands. I sit here this morning, but they cannot truly understand or see what I'm going through. They don't really know me. No, that's true, but Jesus Christ does. Jesus Christ knows you and he's come for you. Has come for you. Just you. And he says, what is your name? Do you know how beautiful that is to me? How wonderful that is? How stirs my soul? We know that the spirits speak. 
And they said, we're many. But in there, he was looking, he was searching out the man. I told you, God is a seeker. Christ is a seeker. And he seeks people out. He seeks out souls, friends. He seeks them out. And he said, what is your name? And he said, Legion, of course. And they begged Jesus again not to send them out of the area. And a large herd of pigs were heading up the hillside. Oh, the disciples. Okay, so we now we've got a Greek, an unclean man, and now we've got pigs. They don't touch pork. They don't go anywhere near pork. And they're like, now yeah, we've got pigs, John and Peter and James, and they're like, pigs? He's teaching them something. I mean, I'm telling you, when you, met Je- when you meet Jesus, you, if you want, if you want, You go way, way out of the box. I mean, you go way, way out of culture. You go way, way out of anything. You go way out. Way out. Because this isn't to do with culture. This is to do with Satan. Christ has come to destroy the works of Satan. That is why he is here and why his spirit remains in us, he has come to destroy the works of the devil. Has he destroyed the works of the devil in your life? And if he has, what are we going to do about it? Because Satan's work is still going on. So he sends them off to the pigs. And the pi- I-, I can't even imagine the noise. Imagine the noise of those pigs running down an embankment and running into the ocean. The noise. The scene. This is just unbelievable, but it's true scene. It happened. And I'm trying to get you into the scene, if though you were there. And so the noise of the pigs, they're running over the embankment. That was enough for the people in the region to be like, what is going on? Somebody's taken my pigs. I better get over there. And so the animal rights and everybody run over there with their placards. Free the pigs, free the pigs. They're there. Like get, and they are not happy with Jesus. And I can tell you, when you do the works of him, Satan is not happy. And you can go home and have people that have come to here, and many of us know this, and it could even happen in your own life at a time, where you're healed and delivered, and you go back and your family says, no way. I want you back on drugs and sleeping around every night. No way. This is just too much. This is too far, this religion. It's too far. That's crazy, yeah? But that's what the people said. Because they go on and they ask Jesus to get out of that place. And that doesn't seem to faze Jesus at all. He doesn't even help the man with the pigs. Oh, here's some money. Oh, Excuse me, Judas, you better, you know, give some money to this guy. He's just lost his livelihood. Because he's there for what? One man. He's there for what? To destroy the works of Satan. That's the reason he's there. Because he was somewhere and he heard something. Then he, he, he got knowledge of what was going on. And then he saw something and then he felt something and then he acted upon it. And that's what God does. He acts upon what he knows, what he feels, what he sees. He he acts upon it. And he went and he acted upon this. And what happened in verse 15? I mean, there was all this ruckus and they came over and they're upset about the sheep. But verse 15, when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there. And... What's the scene now? From crazy, hair everywhere, probably dirty, violent, 
you know, people that are possessed, they, they say all sorts of things. They, they don't know who they are. One minute they're talking to you, one minute they're gibbering, jab. What is it? He's dressed and in his right mind. He's dressed. So Luke 8 obviously had clothes. Because remember, the women that followed Jesus, they provided for his needs. So he, they had clothes. But he said, you know the bag from the women? Get it, it's got clothes in it. Amen? And the men said, no, we have to touch him. We have to touch him. He's like, get those clothes. Joanna and Susanna got those clothes. I need the clothes. Peter, get the clothes. And he clothed him. He gave him back his dignity, gave him back some, his life. And you know the most beautiful about this is they found him sitting with Jesus in his right mind. I mean... This was a crazy man who cried out every night. He cried out in torture. Every night he cried out. He just cried out. There are people in society and they're just inside. Maybe they're not, you know, being crazy, but inside they're just crying out. They're just crying out. They're crying out. They don't have an actual voice, but there's an inner voice that's just crying out and saying, I'm being tortured, I'm being tortured, I'm being tortured. And here was this man just sitting And Jesus is here. And Jesus is just sitting. So I have to ask myself, and maybe a question if you're watching or listening or you're hearing what I'm saying, when was the last time you just sat with Christ, his spirit, just sat? You didn't ring five people. You didn't go to five counsellors. You just sat. You just actually sat. He just sat. There was no need to run. There was no need to be scared. There was just, he just sat. He just sat. He just sat next to Christ. And Jesus sat next to him. And the scene was calm for this man. Other people were going, get out of here. They were probably yelling at you, telling, they were scared. They didn't know what was going on. There was, you know, there was other things going on. And that happens in life. You know, there can be other things going on in our life. There can be circumstances, situations, jobs, people, marriages, careers, sicknesses, and they're screaming at us out here. I mean, they're really screaming. But with Christ, we're just sitting. Inside ourselves, we're just waiting. And he says, be calm. Because the person who knows where they are and where they're going from has great power in peace. Because they're a powerful person. And you meet them even in the world. You know, these powerful people. They're very sure of themselves. Human even on their own can be that powerful. But with Christ, it's a spiritual thing. Because you can have people that are that powerful and they seem calm, but inside, hello, a top Hollywood executive, his life is falling apart. You can have it all, friends. You can have money. You can have the biggest and be one of the most powerful movie moguls in the world. But can end up like this. Why is that happening? Because let me tell you, Satan is out to destroy, hurt, maim, and kill. Is it right? No, of course not right what happened. But my thing is what happens to this man? Is Satan going to take his life now? Because that's what he's after. And so we find this man, and those who'd seen this in verse 16 told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told them about the pigs as well. And the people began to actually plead with Jesus. Get out of here, please get out of here, get out of here. 
And that's what people do. You know, with Christ, it's a choice. When you meet him, you have a choice. Yes, you want him. No, you don't. It's pretty black and white, isn't it? You, you want Jesus or you don't want Jesus. And they were like, get out of here. He had just healed this man that had caused them issues in their region. He, and that, that, they, didn't, they missed it. Here is this man sitting dressed and in a, in a straight, and his mind is back to what he was created to be. And often in our own life, we miss. We miss what Christ is doing or what he has done. Because the other voices get very loud, don't they? They get very loud. Family, jobs, relationships, friendships, they get loud and they tell us, hey, 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 that's too much, Jesus. You've got just too much of him. Don't want him here anymore. And as Jesus was getting back into the boat, as he said, all right, the poor disciples, he must have both looked at them and said, all right, that's enough for today. Goodness me, I've really put them through the ringer. I brought him to a non-Jew, an unclean man, and there's pigs. And they were going to have to explain this to their wives and everyone else. Oh, my goodness. So he was going to get back in the boat. And, of course, the man comes to him. And he says, as Jesus was getting into boat, the man who had been demon-possessed, he begged him, wouldn't you? Oh, come on, wouldn't you? Friends, have you been set free by Jesus Christ? Don't you want to follow him? I mean, this man begged him, please, Jesus, please, wouldn't you? I mean, wouldn't you beg him? The man that came specifically through a storm, through a storm to get to you, through a storm just to get to you. Just to get to you, he went through a massive storm in his life, Jesus, a physical storm. He went through a storm. He was a human man. He went across in a boat through a storm just to get to you. Just to get to you. Wouldn't you beg Jesus? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you say, let me follow you, Jesus? Please, please let me follow you. I, I, I want to be a disciple. I'll do anything for you now. I'll give you anything. I'll do anything for you. Friends, What do you want to do for Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about big works and all I'm just talking about you as an individual person where you are right now. What do you want to give him? What can you give him? Where are you at in your life what you can give? As I said, we're all in different seasons and different and times. I totally understand that. We have to work. We have to, we have to get money. We've got jobs. We have to do these things in our society. This man, he just grabbed on, please let me cut, please. And you know, Jesus is so beautiful. He, he, he gave him a commission. He commissioned this man. He made him a missionary. And he said, no, 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 I've got something better for you. I've got something different. I've got something that suits just you. I'm going to give you back to your family, your wife, your children, your job, your education. I'm going to give you back your rights, your name. You're not faceless anymore. You're not in bondage. You're not being tortured. I'm going to give you back your life and a better one. Because he said to him, go home to your family. Oh. Can you imagine how he felt when Jesus said, they hadn't seen, how long had he seen his family? Go home to your family. How he must have felt. Oh, I'm going to finally see, are they going to want me back? The, the last time they saw me, I was losing my mind. I lost everything. I lost my money, my job, my home, my friends, my relatives, the places I had pizza and cappuccinos and, no, Suvalakis, sorry. He didn't have pizza and cappuccinos, wrong nation. Oh, yeah, Greek food is nice, friends, too. But Jesus said, it's okay, go back to your family. 
Imagine that conversation. No, go back to your family. He told him, go back to your family and then tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Be a missionary, use your testimony and tell them about the mercy of God. I just want to end with this. Jesus makes wrong things right. Thank you for listening. If you have been blessed by this message, please visit our website, neilthomasministries.com and click on the donate button.